Welcome back to Yellow Card Vanguard. We are back here getting some free content with some banlist update restriction reactions. The new banlist affects the new premium format and it's a pretty big one. Let's go over together and see what premium shapes up to be going forward. So first off is a preface by Mori P stating that a lot of these hits came from foreign data. That's us. They're actually listening. That's so good for us. That means we get pursued assault soon, right? Copium. Regardless, it sets a good precedence that Vanguard might look outside of Japan for results to decide their balancing for their other formats too. Starting us off is our choice restriction between Zero with Dragon of Zenith Peak Ultima and any over trigger. Personally, I feel like this is kind of a table 500 interaction and I have no strong feelings towards it. I just feel sorry for the Gizei players that won't be able to flex all six dragons when they choose to play the over trigger instead. Maybe it was the design philosophy of over triggers being a very exciting RNG based game mechanic, whereas Ultima takes out that RNG based aspect of it and just makes it a strategy for the game. Uh, what's your thoughts on this, Zistral? I think they're just afraid of my upcoming Glendios deck. Mood as hell. If anything, I feel like this hits Gold Paladin the hardest, since Gold Paladin is the United Sanctuary deck that spreads out the widest, whereas every other one kind of goes vertically, Gold's goes horizontally. So with more units to spread the over trigger to, that's less of a way that they can actually go to like Ultima Turbo over trigger. I mean, In Gold's also historically were like, Ultima was their main game plan, right? Like, you know, yeah. saw it worlds, so like the Providential Angel line. You saw even, you know, after the Wonder Ezel ban, you know, they would still go for like that turbo, like multi spear cross into Ultima for the Royal Paladin. They have like other win cons. Luard exists as well, don't forget. You know, Luard basically rarely ever goes into Ultima where Morfessor exists. So realistically, like, for decks like Gold Paladin, they're losing the over trigger. And then for decks like, Luard and Royals and Genesis, they're just losing Ultima. Yeah. Uh, so I think that's that's why I think this is a really good like a really good change because it shows variety. It's not just like, oh here's a three pick one, which basically means these two cards are banned. As we'll see going we're gonna see that like in the next slide, but it's still a case of like you know, like there's no right answer here, which I think is a pretty elegant banning. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, I think like you said. It'll, mo it'll mostly be gold paladins got, that get hit by the over trigger choice and shadows and royals will probably be picking actually no it's the other way yeah so shadows royals all the other united sank uh, decks get their ultima hit whereas golds get their over trigger hits and i think it's good to have like that like a uh, cost risk analysis thing where you see like is it is it worth the over trigger is it worth the ultima maybe your deck strategy is to actually have ultima instead of the over trigger in your deck and i think it's good to see what kind of stuff goes forward after that yeah the two clients to keep an eye on for this change will be genesis and oracle think tank i think those two have the most potential to lean either side of the fence and they'll be genesis has some other issues which we'll discuss later on and so does oracle think tank as a matter of fact but i think you know those two decks are going to be shaping up are the most interesting to see how they shape up and which side of the fence they lean on. So next up we have a pair of choice selections here. Uh, the first one is Bermuda Triangles. Uh, choice selection between Colorful Pastoral Fina and Unbelievable Girl Popcorn. So for those of you unaware, uh, these two cards performed an interaction where Fina's skill on Vanguard Circle allows you to activate any on-hits effect even if it doesn't hit. Potpourri is a card that it's a two card combo with herself and herself where you can keep putting her on a force marker keep swinging keep swinging because her attack on hit will always hit regardless if it doesn't i think this is a good hit against bermuda triangle because a on hit effects by nature introduce some sort of game interaction between you and the opponent and potpourri's on hit effect says when i hit do more Fina being able to remove that when i hit clause and Potpourri then just becomes a do more, do more, do more. Kind of turns off the interaction between the Bermuda Triangle player and their opponent. And as such, I think this is a good hit towards the clan. It doesn't hit it too much since I think the best premium clan at the moment was Riviere. This one just kind of removes any kind of upcoming tier 1.5 deck to take up the new slots after the tier 1 decks die. Yeah, I think this was an important hit. It was. It's a good one nonetheless, but it's more like... This is one of the few true infinites remaining in the game, right? Like, yeah. you know, Popery, Bounce Popery, and Call of and so on and so forth. The deck itself isn't actually that amazing. Like, quite early on during the Strictly Broken, like, during the early stages of Team Strictly Broken, you know, back in, like, the 2020 Worlds, like, going into 2020 yeah. Worlds, you know, we were looking at this deck and, like, you know, seeing, like, is, you know, we might want to play this instead of Ezel. But mm -hmm. the problem was that the combo was just a little bit too fragile. 
Yeah, for sure. Uh, it just couldn't get there fast enough like you. This was before Riviera though, so you, you only had like one, maybe two force markers tops. Yeah, at most. Like, you'd two be defensive going... shut down. Yeah, two defensive shut down yeah. the Pokemon. And in fact, that's that's still the case to this day. And the only way to really get around that is to use the upcoming Grade Three from Clan Collection, the one that you know, rest your Vanguard and make yeah. two force markers. Yeah. And then you rewrite into Fino, and then you, know, you have Popery, which is like 49, 59k yeah. sometimes. And at that but point, even you're just then, going. that's still very yeah. Like it's to get to that stage requires actually a lot of work. And not to mention, because Popery requires harmony, you're playing a load of 5k shields in the deck. Oh yeah, so for sure. You lose a lot of like the defensive power, and you don't get like you don't have any speed to make up for it. So I, I actually don't think this deck was that insane to begin with, but I appreciate that it's banned because you know we they just want to get rid of the true infinites. Yeah. Like there's also a little bit of future proofing because you know like one tiny thing can make this deck potentially like. You know, they could release like one card that would make the combo valid. Yeah, which is exactly. Totally fair. So I mean, like, you know, it's it's not something that needed to be hit, but it's not something that I think we're gonna miss anytime soon either. Mm -hmm. Just for the future proofing. In the darker regular side of things, they've got a choice restriction between Dontarian and a new card coming out in DBT03, Steam Mage Assured of. So once again, for those of you unaware, uh, the interaction here is that once you get four Assured of into rotation. Dontarion is effectively a 52k defensive on your opponent's turn. Now, with a lot of these hits that are coming up, as you'll see, the game format has slowed down a lot. That if your opponent is able to get those Assurdas into rotation, it is almost damn nigh impossible to actually put a dent into them. As such, they've kind of made you choose between Dontarion or Assurda. Most likely, this, this kind of just kills both Dontarion in premium and Assurda in premium. But it's an interaction that they didn't want to see in premium, nonetheless. I mean, again, it's the same with the Bermuda Triangle thing. Mm -hmm. It's just a quote-unquote true infinite. Because you know, Ashura comes out of Soul Guard and then goes back into Soul. Yeah. So you just guard with them forever. The problem really is more that... Th again, this is another one of those cases where the deck is not actually very good. Like, you know, exactly. yeah. doesn't get played in premium at all. I don't see Ashura being played in premium either. Like, maybe it could, but I doubt it. Like, so these two cards on their own, like aren't causing anything particularly offensive like neither of these cards are individually very insane so realistically i think this is just one of those we're already here we might as well deal with this and nip in the bud while we can yeah yeah may as well not let anything get out of hand while they're doing this big nuclear ban list all right let's take a look at the next one an update to the pale moon choice restriction here so before we had these two cards purple trapezes and jumping jill already on the choice restriction but now we add flying parrot this is a tough one for Pale Moon players to stomach. Um, the odd interaction between Purple, Periton, Misdirection, Happiness Collector for that hand farming gameplay back in G format is now gone. I do think there was a new replacement for Flying Periton, but I think the Soul Blast cost versus a Soul Charge makes it very hard compared to what it was before. Um, at the same time, Pale Moon historically has always been a deck that always introduced these weird niche interactions which cause weird broken game states. And these kind of cards here is good to choice restrict for future proof reasons. Yeah, I think it's also like, while not truly infinite, you know, the, like you mentioned, like, Happiness Collector, Misdirection, Paris Entropies, it's like, even for non songster variants, like you know, normal Harry versions, uh, Nightmare Dolls, even Hell Moon itself was just a very, very complicated deck that you know, it wasn't that difficult to get to the end result, but the amount of steps it took to get there was huge, and so it was causing very much elongated play patterns, like unnecessarily mm -hmm. long play patterns. And I think that's just one of the things that, I, you know, that alone would have been enough reason to like maybe restrict these cards in some way, shape, or form. Oh yeah. But then you consider that you know these extended play patterns were then also causing very, very powerful effects. Like you know, Harry was doing what, 10, 11 attacks on a first strike turn, like you know, off of what two counter blast. Yeah. You, know, you had uh, Songster, which was Songster, obviously. Yeah. So yeah, like it's. Again, I don't think Pell Moon was inherently broken just by virtue of. It's one of those decks that's very fragile, very hard to play. You know, there were one or two like Pale Moon players in the West that knew how to play the deck and could play it very, very well. But you know, in, compared to say Taro Loop or Dark Irregulars, I don't think it was as dangerous for the format. 
But again, it's it's definitely worth feature crucing getting rid of. And it sort of limits the explosiveness of the format. Because one of the important things about Pelvian is up until this point is that people will be surprised at how much Pelvian has access to. Like, you know, you can use Trapezius and Periton to, you know, even if you're not high roll, you just have like one or two counter blasts, not that much soul, only a few pieces in hand. You're, you go into Dark Side Princess into mm -hmm. Harry and you only get seven attacks instead of nine. Yeah. Like, the whole way, you're drawing, like, Harry Potter's Collector will draw you two cards as well. You're not discarding anything. Everything goes back into Soul afterwards, so it just re it refunds itself. Yeah. Like, that alone just put you in a really advantageous position. So, yeah, I think, it, like, Pelmo is definitely one of the better decks in the format, and it needing a hit in some way, shape, or form was important. Mm -hmm. Obviously, yeah. Trapeus and Imperator was a very powerful engine to begin with. Yeah. So I'm not sure how Pell Moon deals with this going forward. You know, maybe Nightmare Dolls becomes the play, or maybe just a a fairer version of Harry becomes the play. Yeah. It's we'll, we'll have to wait and see. So after the choice restrictions are said and done, now we've got some actual restrictions. Together we have straight up bans on Rain Elemental Zarzan and Tempest Sphere. If you know the history of Yellow Card Vanguard, you know that Zarzan was a very large part of our history. Uh, we just basically smashed everything with Zarzan and everything was a deck. Ever since its induction into the game, Zarzan has been a problem, and getting hit to 1 instead of 0 made it extremely sacky in the decks that would still opt to play 1. And if you're playing Grand Blue, uh, you still had 5 copies of it through Coulombard instead. Uh, game design wise, I think the philosophy of GB was for strong effects to come on after you stride. And cards like Zarzan and Tempesphere broke those rules, and I think it was time for them to say, this was a design mistake, we're getting rid of them ASAP. Also, card fight vanilla fight sucks. Yeah, there's there's no elegant solution for the problem that these cards introduce. Tempesphere was arguably a bit less egregious, but I think if they had left Tempesphere unrestricted, I think there would still have been that sort of passive, like or like implicit uh a, like desire for speed in the format which i think was what they that's something they were trying to avoid with a lot of these restrictions overall you know like they don't want games to just end because something happened you know they want a game to actually be played and you know, tempest fear enabled a lot of very niche strategies to come out and it made some decks that would you know, otherwise have struggled slightly better but i think the trade-off just wasn't worth it and yeah like the the homogeneous it, it makes deck building a bit too homogenous, like, you know, the fact that you always have this option to just shove it and it's good no matter what, was definitely, like, it makes the game trend in a certain direction, and it makes gameplay trend in a certain direction, and I think mm -hmm. getting rid of those is ideal. Ideally, it would have been nice to see a restriction on Huam as well. Yes, I agree. But without Zazan and without Tempest Fear, I think that card is much less of a problem, so yeah. it's, it's not the end of the world. Yeah, and with the introduction of the Great Three Guild Guardians as well, even if your opponent just ends up the damage denying you by not attacking, if you've managed to draw into a Great Three Guild Guardian at that point, you've got that counter blast. You need to play your game at Great Three. Next up, we have the ban on Freezing Witch Bendy. This one makes sense. Opening a copy of the main should not have enabled a four card ride skip package, which in the premium format, which then leads to stride cheating, as you're consistently Great Three before your opponent. In my eyes, this is a good riddance. This is probably like in the same train of thought as the Zarzan and Tempest Sphere hit, a uh, game philosophy hit. We want to like try and bring back striding back to what it used to be, where both players are able to like have their strong turns back and forth, but with like ride skip enablers like Bendy, Wa, as you'll see going forward, that kind of removes the a chance for your opponent to actually have the opportunity to play their strengths, and they're just hoping to survive your strength. Yeah, there's nothing inherently wrong with Ride Skip. The issue with Bendy, and as we'll discuss Tra, is that they're too consistent and they come at virtually no cost. Like, you know, Luard is playing the main already. Playing one Blast of Arc is not the end of the world. Playing one Bendy is not the end of the world. Playing one Damp Hood is not the end of the world. Like, Luard is a deck that can afford the deck space, right? Because all it yeah. really needs is the Dagda into Morfessa, into whatever high power grade ones it wants to fetch. So, compared to, say, Ezel, which needs to dedicate 8 plus cards to the slots, or whatever other Ride Skip decks are still even viable to this point, it's the fact that the water on its own was already good, and this was just like a virtually no cost improvement to make it better. You know, we haven't seen the Ward winning that much since Premium, like, really got going with Premium Collection anyway, so there's an argument that this may not have been necessary, 
but again, you know, like when the ban list is this deep, you kind of want to just not just get rid of the tier one decks, but you also want to hit like knock down a peg yeah. of the decks that would come up to fill that slot. So like you know, once you get rid of like dark irregulars and pale moon loop and all these like fast first stride win mm -hmm. decks, yeah, that's when these slower decks like Luard and so on and so forth will be coming up. So that's why I think you. Know, yeah, it's good just, to nip those in the bud. Exactly. And then we've got the problem girl, Taro. Taro, since her induction, has been one of the problem cards of Vanguard. I think she introduced one of the first loops in Vanguard's history, being Fenrir Wiseman. And now she's back to terrorize in premium again with the new Fenrir support in Hazande. Then we have Crude for even more soul charging. And I've even seen stuff about the new V collection of Valencia to just put more Taros back into soul after they've been soul blasted by accident. The card is obviously not future proofed. Uh, it's not a once per turn, it's not a named once per turn. In conjunction with Genesis being a force deck with having Valkyrion, they have then they then they have access to that 16 stand build, but also access to Taro. It's just not a card that's helpful for the game. And it was about time for it to go. Yeah, so there's, there's there's a few angles to approach this from. So the first one, well, the easy one to talk about is multiple attacks. So going back to like late G era when Taro was first printed, that deck wasn't truly infinite. You, know, you were limited by the amount of counter loss you had <laughs> on the Hell Sky Stride, and then your Wiseman capped out at like 40 something K power. And you, know, you could get up to, I think it was what, like 18, 19 attacks, but not much more than that. Yeah. So like, you know, it was it was really good, but it wasn't like anything insane. But then obviously with force markers and as they kept printing new cards, it got worse and worse and worse. And the main thing with Taro is that So I'm gonna talk about like what we lose before why we lose it. Mm -hmm. okay. I think the main thing about Taro is that Genesis really loses a lot of its clan identity, like, you know. It's, Genesis has always been a clan that focused on soul and then leveraging the soul, like actually actively soul blasting for cost. Yeah. Compared to say, Pale Moon that you used to solve lot that you stole as a resource for its board, or Di that you sold as like a, a floodgate for its effects. Mm -hmm. Genesis was actively generate soul and then use it to do other good things like retire your opponent's board or get two crit or so on and so forth. And Taro was just Taro is one of those cards that gave you another angle, like you know, a different, yeah. a different way of utilizing that resource. Because okay, now you're turbo soul, char soul charging, and now when you soul blast, you might get some benefit out of it. And so yeah, like you know, losing Taro definitely is not great because it pretty much means that the only real Genesis deck left is Regalia. Mm -hmm. But you know, the issue is that. Like I said, Taro has multiple facets to it, and it's not just the multiple attacks. As you say, Kazande and the Grade 1 Keta card, just the infinite Soul Blast fans give you now infinite access to infinite power. Mm -hmm. Like that alone is not ideal because it's not even a true it's not even infinite that wins the game the way Potpourri does. It's an infinite that you can use it to stall and just force the game into a draw if that's what you so wish. And that's mm -hmm. definitely yeah. unhealthy no matter how you cut it. And the other thing as well is you know, not putting aside like Valkyrian and all this stuff, the issue with Taro is that there were they despite knowing what it was capable of, like you know, the G Wiseman deck was discovered fairly soon. Despite that, they kept they kept printing enablers. And I think this sounds weird, because when you look at it in hindsight, Taro is the enabler and stuff like Wiseman and Gletner are the payoff. Yeah. But no, realistically, Taro was always the payoff. And then Glettner and Wiseman was the enabler. Yeah, we we're so always like, trying to get when... the Taros to be sold. Exactly. So like when when the quote unquote combo was first discovered, if they had just banned Wiseman on the spot, it would have been fine. And then if yeah. they had never printed Glettner, it would have been fine. Mm -hmm. It's just those are like and those effects aren't effects that you need in Genesis either. Whereas an effect like Taro is actually really nice to have. Yeah. And so. I think the problem with Taro is that they approach design from the wrong perspective. You know, they were like, rather than looking at what already existed and how to play to it, they kept trying to break new ground with Genesis, and that is what you know, eventually broke yeah. the canvas back mm -hmm. because it was like, oh, this doesn't interact nicely, and at that point they were just too deep in, which is unfortunate. But again, yeah. I, mean, I don't think Taro was the most elegant solution. It was the easiest solution because it's a one-card mm -hmm. ban. Yeah. But realistically, the most elegant solution would have been to make Valkyrian and Wiseman loops 
unplayable in some way, shape, or form, either through an errata or whatever. Yeah. Because the... I I yeah. love the Kartaro. I I love what it does for Regalias. I love what it did for Amaruda back in the day as well. It's just that compared to like what Taro does for that deck and what Taro did for like the loop decks, it's just so drastically different. And yeah. unfortunately that even though one deck uses Taro one way and the other deck uses Taro the other way, Taro ended up being a problem in that deck, which then by uh what's that term called? By accident also hitting the other deck as well. So it's yeah. sad to see her go, but like I think I don't want to see them do any erratas anymore because getting Riviera errata sucked. So errataing um, Valkyrion to be like something like this card can only drive check once per turn. Errataing Taro even might have been the answer. But like I said, erratas are should be avoided at all costs. Yeah, like you know, don't get me wrong. I'm glad that Wiseman and Valkyrion no longer exist. Yeah. But I also think that. There were there were other ways of approaching that problem. Like it was definitely a problem. It's just a shame that they had to do it in this heavy-handed way. Mm -hmm. Just to, you know, like there, there's, there's two sides of the coin here. Is what is the point? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So next up we have a restriction for Nubatama. So Jamyo Kongo went from the two pick one list to straight up restricted. In the West tier, I don't think Nubatama was highly representative, and this must have been a thorn in the side in the Japanese side of the premium format, where most players ignored Rene and just went to the Jamyo Kongo. This one, I guess in a sense, just reading Jamyo Kongo's effect does make sense, because when you're playing in like a high speed format like premium, being locked to four cards in hand maximum when you're playing on the defensive, being locked to four, can four cards in hand maximum when you're playing on the offensive as well means that you're not able to aggress the Nubatama player and they're just able to keep tempoing you out of the game. It just kind of makes the game kind of unfun. Now, Jamyo Kongo being gone, I don't think that's a big issue, especially since now that we have Dai Hozon to take his place. Dai Hozon also has that kind of pseudo hand rip mechanic. What's your thoughts on it? The thing about Jamio is that, you know, like you say, like it wasn't very popular in the West. The Western builds of Nubatama were either uh, vanilla focused, so like, you know, using Mowak to turn on Jamio on turn three to go down to four instead of six immediately. And then, you know, like going into like Tempest Sphere and Cyclone and hitting you with the base two crit 3k vanillas that went out of 23k because of Cyclone. Mm -hmm. That, there was that, or there was the quote unquote like, you know, aggro build that just played Jamio and just stuck it and just slowly like made your life miserable and I think yeah those, those were both not pleasant to play against but I don't think those were the hugest problems like looking at the like from my from my limited recollection the Japanese Twitter lists that you know, were playing Jamio were playing very normal Nubatama decks mm -hmm. and I think it's as you say like you know, being restricted on cards in hand even against like other fair decks was just it created for a negative gameplay experience I mm -hmm. suppose I think so that's I think the main thing to problem. say, yeah. yeah. So, it's not as if like the card is broken, I think the card is just toxic, so to say. Yeah, it's, it's again, it's one of those like tier 2, like, you know, if we're gonna hit those, we might as well hit this as well, just so it doesn't become a problem later on. Mm -hmm. uh, and speaking of toxic, Murakumo mm -hmm. has two bands coming up. The first one being the bitch Nue Dayo. Nue Dayo is one of the cards when I was looking at premium collection, I initially thought this is not normal. Similarly to what we saw in like ride skips and stride skips, Nue Dayo is another superior stride inside of itself with a condition inside of itself with an on attack skill that matches its superior stride condition to restand everything. Now, mind you, you're doing this when your opponent is great too, so this card is just not... It's just not healthy to play against. Um, the card was designed, how do I say, too well? In a sense that everything works so well together. And I think the worst part of it is just the fact that it is a superior stride within itself. I think the main problem with Nua Dio is that there were just too many enablers. Like, you know, if, when the card was first printed, I actually still believe it was largely manageable at the time because the only way like 
The only way they could do a Dio back then was either through uh, Hyaki, which required Counter Blast, or Hugo, which required Counter Blast. And beyond that, they were only, they, you know, all they had to rely on was uh, dual weapon, not dual weapon, what's it called? Obero mm -hmm. So the consistency of the deck was quite low, and you know, the explosiveness just wasn't as high, because then now they're relying on like Metamorphox and the grade 2 name Copier, yeah. so their numbers actually don't hit as hard, so you just, at, back then, you would just guard all the rear guards, take the vanguard swing, hopefully get a defensive, and then you can just, you know, the rest of the rear guards are no longer a threat. Yeah. But then we got Huam, then we got Zazan, uh, then we, you know, we get, we're getting the heal guardians, which would have made the deck even more ridiculous. Yeah. And so it slowly escalated, and you know, as people like, as people realized that there were le there was less they could do about it, it became a lot harder to. It became a real threat in that case of that you know, anyone can now just pick up newer Dio and take games, whereas before like it was kind of player restricted. Yeah. And yeah, it just became too easy, too fast. And with the way that deck building trended, you know, because the newer dial was just so good in such a variety of situations, there was no more like, oh, I'm going to play this so I don't lose the newer dial anymore. Like, you reached a point where if you weren't playing Link Joker and you weren't playing Freeze Ray Dragon, yeah. and they put newer dial on the table, you were pretty much guaranteed to lose that turn unless you hit like two defensives in a row, one of which was a heal. Yeah. So, yeah, I think just for the sake of like opening up lines of play, this is a really good ban. You know, it's yeah. You're you're no longer at risk of just randomly dying on turn two. Yeah. Which I think opens up the format a lot more, which is what they're trying to go for here. Yeah, I think that's awesome. And once again with Murakumo, uh, Hanba's banned. So I think whereas the West leaned more towards like the new way Dio plays, uh, I think the Japanese side of things played with the Tamba, the Metamorphox, the hit dual weapon infinite loop. Yeah. Yep. And as we said, infinite loops creates for a game state where one of the players is masturbating, the other person is watching. And obviously that's not really gameplay, that's literally just watching VTubers play their games on stream. Yeah, so the thing about Tanba is that it's a true infinite that does actually win the game on the spot when you assemble it. But the issue is that that deck requires, like that combo requires four different moving pieces. So it's actually surprisingly difficult to set up, especially in a deck like Murakumo that doesn't have selective hard plussing. I don't think the deck was inherently broken by any means. It could win games out of nowhere, and if you didn't know how to play into it, it was very, very powerful. I'll grant it that. You know, it's obviously not on the same level as Nua Dio, but again, I don't think it was a massive problem, but I respect that they're trying to kill in like true infinite combos, so mm -hmm. it's fine. And you know, the, like when Tanba first came out, uh, the loop was originally like a five or six card combo because we didn't yeah. have V Metamorphos at the time. You had to like do some weird stuff to get dual weapon to work the way it needed to work. But then eventually, you know, they released V Metamorphox. They released yeah. uh, the Grade Two Bird thing. Yeah. So the combo became a bit easier over time, and obviously the game the game environment accelerated or it outgrew and outpaced the Tamba loop. But the Tamba loop was still always there. Yeah. So. If they, don't, if they didn't hit it now, it was always going to be there, and you know, someone yeah. would always play it and just like sneak into top 8 of an event. And I can see, you know, like, it's it's just one of those things that it causes more hassle than it's worth. Yeah, and especially with it being an infinite loop in itself, it just probably just takes so much round time that it just leads to a lot of, like I said, stale gameplay, whereas one person's playing and one person. Yeah, especially because, like, unlike, say, the Athena Potpourri loop, you can't just tell your opponent, oh, I have this assembled, I'm gonna hit you with a 59k Athena four times, or infinite times, either hit five either hit five defensives right now or lose, mm -hmm. and you can just, like, end the game there. But with Tanba, you actually have to play it out, because, you know, if they let it hit, you have to resolve the dual weapon line, if they, if they don't, you have to resolve the Tanba line, mm -hmm. It's like you actually have to go through the actions in order to demonstrate the look. You can't just say like, "Oh, this is gonna happen. This is gonna happen," and then you you, know, you have no cards in hand. You take five damage. You die. Yeah, it's not it's not as easy to shortcut. Then we have an unfortunate restriction here in Zinc. Uh, I'll let you take the reins on this one since I'm not too familiar on Premium Chaos. So Chaos isn't inherently broken by any sense. Like it's a very strong deck and it has a lot of very unpleasant interactions with the rest of the field. 
But yeah, I'm, I'm more than willing to admit that playing into Chaos can be quite miserable a lot of the time, especially when your opponent knows what your deck does and can play around it fairly effectively. Uh, Zinc is probably one of the most important cards in the deck because Chaos consumes a lot of resources. You know, it's Universe as a Counterblast, you have Zirconium for a Counterblast, the new Palladium, if you choose to use it, it's going to cost a Counterblast. And the problem with Chaos compared to every other deck is that the individual resources in Chaos don't immediately make themselves obvious. Like, take Royal Paladin, for example. Mm -hmm. Spending one Counter Blast in Royal Paladin, you know exactly what you're going to get for that one Counter Blast. You know, you're going to get, like, 10k power, yeah. or maybe deck search for a grade one, or maybe, like, draw a card or something along those lines. Whereas the cost of one Counter Blast in Chaos is a lot harder to measure, because that one Counter Blast could be uh, Old Colony Maker, deck search for something. It could be Palladium to mill you for one. It could be Universe to rip a card out of your hand, etc., etc. Yeah. And likewise, you know, when you're using Chaos to Soul Blast like every turn, you have Aldani, you have Deluge, you have Close. The cost of one Soul Blast in Chaos just goes a really long way. And it's not like, you know, even if you deny Chaos, they're still going to play their game plan. That's yeah. why Zinc is so important. I don't think it like, was that popular either in the West or in Japan. I can see them like being worried that, oh, maybe you know, with some of the new cards and with the way the format is going to shape up, it would end up becoming one of the better decks, like, you know, maybe the best deck in the upcoming format. Yeah. So I'm not hugely upset at a preemptive ban. You know, Chaos, like, Chaos as a deck doesn't die. Like, you can still build and play a Chaos deck. It's just going to be a lot worse and a lot less dominant than before. So, you know, it's, it's an unfortunate loss, but it's a sacrifice I was willing to make to get rid of some of the other cards we're getting rid of. Yeah. I think Link Joker is going to... Chaos in particular is going to have trouble adapting, so we'll see. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm obviously, like, if I had to choose between being upset and being happy, I'm obviously more upset. But I think I will eventually get over it, even if that means mm -hmm. that I don't play Chaos again for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the way that I saw Zinc was like even if you even if you match Chaos's pace, like playing any other deck, you play into Chaos, you're matching their pace, you slow your game down incredibly, so that way the locks are less impactful, you're able to whittle down the Chaos opponent's resources by attacking rear, deny them a counter blast and such. Every Zinc they pull is another two two more turns about. Uh, more locks, more hand control, and so that's why I thought though Zinc was a centerpiece in the resource management for Chaos, I think it was a piece that needed to go because like even if you were able to match the Chaos gameplay, play the way that you needed to play to play into it, Zinc would then just extend the turns that your, your opponent would be able to uh, put you in a chokehold. Yeah, kind of. I mean, like I said, Zinc is one of the most important cards in the deck. I think if you wanted to knock Chaos down a peg, it wouldn't have been the card I would hit. I probably would have looked at hitting maybe Barrel Wall, or maybe Close, mm. or maybe even Glue Ball itself, because Glue... Yeah, yeah Glue Ball. Beyond, beyond say, like, beyond, say, Glendio's shenanigans, Glue Ball is probably one of the main win cons left in Chaos as a deck. And especially because the thing that people forget is that in all formats, Chaos has a surprisingly difficult time putting people on 6 damage. Yes. Oh yeah, yeah. Glue, balls, glue Ball is one of the main ways of getting there. So like, those probably would have been a better hit if Barrow Wall or Glue Ball had been hit, then Chaos would still have been a very good deck, which, you know, m maybe it would have been, like, too good. I mean, you know, that's very possible. So I, I can see that they chose, like, they decided to err on the side of caution and just, like, make sure that Chaos wasn't going to be a problem, which with Zinc, now it won't be, even though it's, you know, it'll still exist, just defang significantly. Mm -hmm. Right, then we've got the last three restrictions. First one on the chopping block, Daimonis. Um, fuck this card. This card has been a thorn in card design. Not even uh, the premium format, just card design by itself. Ever since Gastil Daimonis' release and its impact on the meta, it feels like a lot of Dark Irregulars and in the same vein Dark States cards have been designed into a rut. Um, yeah. You can kind of see this in like the new Reiji, where that card is kind of just played by itself. 
because they didn't want to make a new grade 3 boss that Diamond Ass could also steal the effects of. And now you've got like a Reiji combined with an NLK who's combined with, I don't know, sure, let's say a Shara as well. Who also then next turn can combine with a Baleful Repressor to get the grade restrict, guard restrict. The card was just a design nightmare. And I'm glad to see it go. I hope that this means that in the going in the future, future V collections for Darker Regulars will be a lot more healthier than what we got for Reiji. Dark states of uh, boss designs won't be locked to just playing Bruce. Like hell, like what if like there was like Bruce Stride Diamond Ass? Or like Bruce Reride Stride Doya Diamond Ass suck into Bruce again, then you've got Final Rush Diamond Ass. It's just Diamond Ass just kind of put a hamper on card design. Like the thing about restricting design space is one thing. Like sure, yeah, every grade three they print from now on has to be like double checked and double considered. But the thing that people <laughs> might not realize or might forget is that ever since Cla uh, Premium Collection came out, Dark Regulars wasn't actually that oppressive of a deck. Like you know, it has struggled into New Edio, it struggled into any vanilla deck, it struggled into Tempest Sphere, it struggled into Grand Blue. The deck wasn't you. Know, it wasn't like the tier zero format it was during Worlds of 2020. But despite that, you know, it was still. It was still a deck that was better than it had any right be, because yeah, at that point, like the moment you put Diamond Ass on the table, you're playing two cards for the price of one. You know? Yeah. And, like any in any card game, like having that level of uh, economy is just it's not good for the game's health because you're now walking like everyone's always going to walk on eggshells because like uh, at any point they could just go into Diamond Ass and you know I like I have to worry about X, Y, and Z and yeah. One, like one really interesting uh, parallel I want to draw is the Leonard Derrick line that's coming out in D standard. Mm -hmm. So you know, you know, up until now, the best way to play against Bruce has been to leave your board empty so that yep. their Leonard doesn't get value. But now, if you leave your board empty, their Derrick gains massive value. Exactly. Yeah. Whereas with Diamond Assay, it was always the same thing. Like, oh, if I play like if I worry about the NLK line. I'm just going to lose to Shahara and Moth. If I worry about the Shahara line, mm -hmm. I'm just going to lose to V Gastiel, and so on and so forth. Yeah. And that's, uh, I think that's a, another unhealthy consideration that a lot of people might have otherwise missed. Yeah. Like, you know, again, Dark Regulars, like I said, it might not have been the best deck, but it was still a really good deck going mm -hmm. like, yeah. into this For premium sure. season. So, you know, even, e like, you know, when I said it loses really bad to Nua Dio and it loses really bad to Vanilla decks, now that those have been banned, like there's even more of a reason to hit the to hit DI. Yeah, exactly. And let's not forget that DI, like through the cards in V, and even some of the cards in G, DI probably is the textbook definition of like generic good stuff cards. Like there's yeah. a lot of cards in DI that is just good. On like a baseline level, it is good. It can go into any deck. It'll be good. Like. You, you pair that up with like into a meta that's just like been thrown into shambles, you know that DI will be like a stable foothold, and that's probably why they had to hit Diamond Ask when they had to do it right now. Yeah, D, like, DI is the third longest lasting deck in premium behind Bermuda and Luard. Like, it's been good since 2018. And obviously, like, the exact shape it's taken has changed every single time, but the main concept has always been there, you know, either through like the NLK turbo lists from 2018 through to the MOF lines with Diamond Ass and so on and so forth. And it's just a case of, you know, there's one argument saying like, oh, but you know, all the people have been like been playing DI for ages, invested for ages, you know, like their their investment is now losing value. It's like, yeah, sure, but what about the people who decide to invest into like say Victor or yeah. MLB? Like the you know the existence of DI itself has invalidated those investments for just as long. So yeah. I think it's like, yeah, it's it's unfortunate, but I think it was it's it's unfortunate that the card had to be banned, but I think it's also unfortunate that the card existed in the first place. Yeah, for sure. I think it's something that if it never existed, we got a different kind of stride. I think nobody would be complaining this hard about DI. Yeah, yeah. And then we've got in the pale moon, visible songster. So visible songster is part of the infamous a songster loop. Once again, another loop, and that's probably why I had to get rid of. It's just something that just takes up a lot of time in the game, something that 
was effectively almost another infinite loop that would win the game as well. Yeah, you basically, uh, again, for those of you that don't know, most of us on Team Strictly Broken, you know, we had two players on the team who were very, very, very strong Pale Moon pioneers in the form of Nikki and Yue. And I think between, like, me, those two, and, like, one other guy, we were able to build a version of Songster that, you know, it did use the vanilla engine of, like, Zazan and Cray Elementals and Vanillas, but it also had all the other DR, uh, Pale Moon pieces and was just able to... I think at its peak, if you like played it to the high roll, you could set up your columns to be 55k through Cyclones, which means that you could 0 to 6 people through defensive triggers, no problem. And, you know, there's an argument for saying like, oh well now Zazan is banned, now Tempest Sphere is banned, and, you know, now that there's the Trapezist and the Periton restriction, did Songster really need to be hit? And the argument is, no, not really, but it's better to just get rid of it anyway because all they have to do is print something to replace Periton or Trapezist, or you know, any two cards, like... Yeah. There, there were ways of going from three rear guards on the board to five rear guards on the board with Songster, as long as you had enough CB. So, yeah. the problem wasn't that you know, that exact version of the loop, or that iteration of the loop, was particularly broken. I mean, it was one of the better decks, because as long as it went off, it was almost unbeatable. But it wasn't tier zero, like, you know, we tested it a bunch and it would beat DI sometimes, but not all the time. It would beat Nuadayo sometimes, but not all the time. But it's more that the resiliency and the flexibility was just a little bit too much. And, you know, again, like, it is, it, it is basically a true infinite. You basically count the number of cards in your deck, divide yep. it by two, and that's how many attacks you have against your opponent, which they have to guard at some point. So yeah, just another true infinite, another like long-winded gameplay that you had to do that would then just cause the game to be one-sided and just log the game for your opponent. Yeah, I mean, like I think, I think some variant of the Songster, like a non-infinite version of the Songster loop, could exist at some point, especially like you know, if when it's slowed down without access to Zazan or Tempest here, mm -hmm. because the up until this point, Songster loop did need GB one to go off. Or you actually need a GB2 because you need to count charge with tier. So, you know, as long as, like, if they find a way to, like, reintroduce a sort of, like, multi attack pattern, as, you know, as long as it requires setup and a time gate, I think it's fine. It's just that the fact that you know, one or two cards pushed songs are just a little bit too far over the edge in terms of speed and consistency, that, that's what made it the problem. And while those cards are still gone, I. I you know, it's again a preemptive future proofing ban so that something like that doesn't happen again. Alright, going on to Bermuda Triangle. Wow. So this one is a bit of a hard hit for me as well since I played Riviera and Female. Uh, losing Twa was effectively losing two pieces in one. Uh, we lost our superior stride skill with Twa, but we also lost one of the best rearguard attackers as well. Similarly to the band to Nuedayo, to the band to Bendy, I think they wanted to slow the game down where superior striding, like striding when your opponent's on grade 1, and then doing your second stride when your opponent's only on grade 2. Obviously, that's not fun for your opponent. Your opponent still has yet to play their game before they're looking down two Trioa attacks with three Twa attacks on like two Force Markers. Oh, mind you, that's threefold as well now, since we're losing an extra force marker from the Riviera Rewrite as well. And I guess with the introduction of Repair Raid from the Clan Collection as well, and with Flom still being a thing, is there's less chance for your opponent to damage deny you now, which means you do get that two counter blast going into grade three, which lets you not only do Repair Raid skill for that three force marker plus three to hand, but you can crawl right after to go into Riviere, get the fourth force marker, stride into a stride, attack with Twa on like four force markers, why not? Swing, Twa restands, and then similarly to like what the current Riviere endgame will be, which is Megiddo, Twa was also the best unit to call out of Megiddo as well. Losing Twa really hurts, but I think it needed to happen for the health of the game going forward. Because Bermuda Triangle Riviere was the desk on the was a deck on the cusp of being tier 1 as well. Yeah, I think the problem with Pra is a very similar problem to Taro in that it just did a little bit too much. Like I so, said, you know, it was both your superior ride, 
it was a very powerful attacker, and you know, like very similar to with Bendy, it was just a little bit too consistent. Like the fact that you could splash it into non Rivia specific decks, like we saw with the Orange back in early premium, mm -hmm, yeah, it gave you an edge. That the edge itself wasn't inherently insane, but it definitely was a little bit too much compared to everything else. And especially the thing to remember is that you know, even in like say a poor case scenario where it's like turn three. Like even on, you know, you ride grade three, you use trust, you put your stride, and then you still have you know, force mark on the rear guard. Troy is definitely going to restand. That's at least three attacks, all of which are at least twenty one k that you have to deal with, mm -hmm. and that's like that on its own isn't inherently super busted, but it is very threatening and it just scales too well, especially yeah. because you you really don't lose much for it. Like any any cards, like you lose a lot of cards in hand. Sure, like if you go for the full like turn two double try into whatever. You'll end up with like one card in hand before your drive checks. But the point is that giving up cards for speed is a totally acceptable thing to make because Bermuda just has that innate pressure built in from things like Tirua Stride and Megiddo and Balanera. Like, it doesn't matter how hard Bermuda negs because at some point you're not going to be able to keep up with the aggression. And I think that's what really pushed the deck over the edge. Like, mm -hmm. It, it's completely the opposite route to when we saw Ange get restricted, because Ange was restricted because it just extended the game, yeah. whereas Tra was just accelerated the, accelerated the game way too much, because it did everything you needed to do a ton ahead of schedule. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that's the main thing too, it was ahead of schedule. So like, in, in conjunction with the Selena ride skip, in conjunction with Twa as well, your opponent was looking at two Tiroa swings, they were looking at three Twa strings, and they're only on grade two. They don't have access to G guards even at that point. So most likely than not, either they would be dead or on their fifth damage. In which case, if they're able to do anything on their stride with like what little hand they have left, they look down at Megiddo with multiple twas again. So this hitting twa does hit a lot of aspects of the Riviera deck. But this means that the Riviera deck then, instead of building vertically towards that right skip, stride, superior stride play, can play a bit more horizontally towards building that board presence. Lastly, about the ban list we have to talk about are stand triggers. So, in the western side of things, mostly 16 stand decks have been rising up to infamous popularity. The two biggest offenders are Valkyrion and Blade Masters, as these are the two decks that have rear guards have their own drive checks. So the main rule change here is that a rear guard that is stood by a stand trigger cannot perform drive checks until the end of the turn. And obviously if you get it during during a drive check, you still finish said drive checks. Um, now initially when I realized the problem with stand triggers, I went for it a different way, whereas uh, a rear guard can only be stood by a stand trigger once per turn. Which means you only ever ever get two attacks out of one of these rear guards before you swing with your vanguard. And even if your vanguard gets said stand trigger, nothing would happen. I think their alternative of having the rear guard not be able to perform drive checks after they've restood by a stand trigger is probably better, since it keeps that deck's identity in line with its game plan. But it doesn't really do that 0 to 6 explosive 2 crit, 2 crit, 2 crit, 2 crit, 2 crit game plan that it has at the moment. It's something that you have to build towards. Like, you can still play 16, uh, 16 stand Vision, you can still play 16 stand Valkyrion. You just need to play more until that like double stand trigger turn becomes your winning game plan. I don't know about this. Like, it's a pretty inelegant fix. Like, any change to the rules is by default inelegant. Mm -hmm, yeah. But I, I see that it does beat just like straight up banning or restricting stand triggers in these decks. I personally would have just changed it to be like stand triggers cannot target units that have uh, that have drive check, check abilities, because then you know, like with that wording, it's consistent with you can't use stand triggers on your vanguard as well. Just say yeah. like. Stand triggers cannot be used to stand units that drive check. Simple as. You know, it, it completely kills the idea of these decks, but I think that's for the best anyway. Like, I don't think... You know, the problem with these 16 stand decks is that instead of like playing the game with speed about you know, who can stride first, who can like 
zero strike and first or whatever. They skip that together and go for a different game speed and then you know, they just ride grade three and win. And rather than you know, like going rather than win in the traditional sense of like you know the V era, like I'm just gonna hit you with like a three crit unguardable attack and like overwhelm you with advantage, yeah. it was literally win on the spot. And that made it really hard to interact with because especially, you know, there's not enough disruption in the format to be able to address them even on uh without uh, outside of like some specific G guards or whatever. Mm -hmm. So it just made for it, it wasn't like you were playing against the clock when you played against these decks, it was more like you were playing against the dice. Like, you know, did, you know, do they ride turn three yeah. and go for it? Do they, you know, like, does their drive checks, do they flip enough blue cards on the, on the drive checks? Like, and I think that's what the unpleasant part of the gameplay was, in that, you know, very similar to the song story, you weren't playing the game, you were just watching them play the game. Yeah. That's why I think, you know, the idea of, like, standing stuff like that should have just been hit from the beginning. I agree. Alright, now let's just go into a bit of a segue here. After all said and done, after all of these bans come into effect, based on your skill of card evaluation and your skill of deck building, what do you expect to see as like the forerunner into this Wild West meta? Three clans, I think, come out the best. Spike Brothers, obviously they lost Tempest Sphere, yeah. but their core game plan is still intact. Mm -hmm. They just slow down a bit. But that's fine because the rest of the format slows down a bit. Uh, Grand Blue becomes still very good. Like that deck was always great. Yeah. It even without like the Cyclone and the Zazan and the Tempest Sphere engine, you know, it had enough toolboxing and you know, they can still reach their final game plan of just hitting you with four very, very, very big Skull Dragons. Yeah. I think that deck's still very good. I think Gold Paladin is still pretty solid. Like yeah. Anyway, we say that it loses the over trigger, but. That deck is still, it, you know, Ezel is still the ride skip deck of choice for premium. Yeah. And it still has access to its ride skip. It just loses a bit of reach in the process, which is fine. Bringing it back to the high roll deck it always once was, I think, is totally acceptable. Mm -hmm. So yeah, those are like my main three to keep an eye on. Yeah. Uh, I think OTT does pretty well as well. You know, it didn't lose to, it didn't lose anything. It's always been like tier 1.5, tier 2, premium. Yeah. I've got, I've got my eyes on OTT right now. Yeah. I think... It was just always a bit of a slow deck, but yeah. now that the format's slowing down, that's probably going to work out yeah, exactly. in its favor. Yeah, so like, OTT's main core gameplay was basically just to have Tempest Spear, not only to not as just a way of plussing itself, but it only cared to get that GB to turn on Calico early. Now that we have... Now that most decks will be able to stride at least twice, in my opinion, OTT is always going to hit that GB. And then you were always going to be able to use that Calico on our Momo turn to get like 68k quad crit double Momo swings. Yeah. So the core gameplay is Which is, which is, is fine, like, at the, you know, in, in the context of everything else. Like, yeah. You know, at that point, Kagura will have purged you, Link Joker will have used Deluge on you, mm -hmm. you know, Grand Blue will probably have gone through at least like maybe one or two big Obadiahs. Yeah. So it's not like Genesis still has the Regalia play of restanding yeah. like yeah, the restanding the Earth for crit Earth. Yeah, so yeah. It's everyone's now on that same playing field of well, yeah. yeah now we're all going to do silly stuff. It's just going to happen on turn five. Yeah, exactly. So like some of us happening on turn three. Yeah, all all the two tier uh, all the tier two decks with all like their how to say big imaginative uh, finisher turns, they'll all be able to do said finisher turns. Uh, instead of just like losing straight up to like all the top six and then like instead of straight, straight up losing to like the next set of six underneath it as well since everything kind of got nipped in the bud nothing's the clear ahead of the meta right now uh, I am curious as to see how stride denial plays into the current game plan we talked about this before about how like cards that in the B premium those like pseudo stride decks where you go into Lambros, you Soul Blast its Hava so you ride back down to grade two in Chrono Jet, you can Soul Blast the Chrono Jet to ride back down to your grade 2. That way you get your Force Markers, and then next turn you re-ride, get another Force Marker, and then you stride into next stage. Basically, Yeah, like try going, going first big grade 3 turns were a really big thing in V. Yeah. And it's a shame that you know, we didn't get to see those translated across the premium at all, because if you're going to be going first and ride grade 3 and do stuff, you might as well just play Blade Master or Valkyrian. Yes. Whereas now, like, you know, you might see a return of Anger Blader, but could come back. Uh, you know, Overlord now has a lot of options because it can go first and use mm -hmm. V the cross on you, or it can go second and like go into Dungeon Valor, etc., yeah. etc. Et like this, 
the, the game is no longer predicated on losing in the first three turns anymore, which I think gives every single deck a lot more breathing room. Exactly. I think that's 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 the main takeaway here. Yeah. And uh, going forward, I think the best decks in the new premium format will have either or ideally both. When going first, a really strong going first strategy. Like, I'm thinking about stuff like Luard, where going first, they have three Force Markers farmed. Uh, they have a plus three to board. Um, they have their Ritual set up. I'm talking about stuff like Chronojet, similarly Force Marker farming. The ability to negate Stride on your opponent's turn. But at the same time, these decks also need to have a really strong going second game plan. If they're given this chance to first Stride, they need a really strong impactful Stride to kind of negate uh, what your opponent did on their first or grade third at three. Um, off the top I, of I my think that head, interest yeah. is going to be a big thing there because when you look at like New Adio, you look at Gastille, so many of these decks that needed to strike just don't care. You know, there's like, I just need to survive grade three, your grade three turn, and then I put down New Adio and then you lose, or, you know, I just survive like, and it doesn't matter how much Luard farms on grade three, the moment Gastille comes down, yeah. you're dealing with eight attacks, one, two of which are really, really, really huge. So yeah, I think it's definitely like everything come becomes a lot more in line in terms of power levels, which I think is a general overall positive. It introduces a lot more gameplay. Right. Lastly, what I do have to say is this. Now is the best time to get into Premium Vanguard if you were ever on the fence. The game is very healthy now, now that we are in an experimental format. You should try everything out that you enjoy about Vanguard. Your favorite clans, your favorite archetypes, your favorite units. Try them all out in the premium format. Pick up some strides, test them out on TTS, test them out on CFA. I'm looking forward to the new premium format and I hope our enthusiasm is contagious to you as well. That's all we've got to say about the ban list, but don't think that this is the last you've heard from us about premium. This has been Toku and Zistro from Yellow Card Vanguard, signing off.